now. Okay, so on World Suicide Prevention Day, the 10th of September this year, we launched in Birmingham, My GP Guide, hashtag My GP Guide, as you can see on the slide. So led by Maria McHale, um, the guide is an evidence-informed resource co-designed with young people, for young people with lived experiences of self-harm or and or suicidal behaviour. And the aim of the guide is to prevent support, um, to provide support, and um, we're taking the first step towards getting help um, during a mental health crisis from a GP. So it seeks to prepare a young person for a GP consultation, aiming to support them in like how to talk to a GP about their self-harm or about their suicidal experiences. And you will see on your slide here, you've got a QR code, so please do scan this and you will be able to access the guide. So against the background of the launch of that guide, today we're going to be having an amazing panel discussion about how we can support young people to talk about self-harm and suicidal experiences with their GP. Now I need to acknowledge obviously the sensitivity of the topic and I will post in the Q&A um, two helplines just in case you feel the need for them. So over the next hour, at first, I'm going to take the panellists through a number of questions and go to them, um, not in a particularly rigid way, but are they all going to have a chance to speak? And then about for about the last 15 minutes, um, I will put the questions from the audience to the panel. So the questions, if you can put them in the Q&A, put them whenever they occur to you. I won't put them to the panellists until that, that sort of last 15 minutes, but if they occur to you as they're speaking, don't worry, I will gather them all up and, and put them to the panelists at the end. So put them in the Q&A whenever they occur to you. And if you would like to tweet about this, um, either the guide or the panel discussion, um, please use, use the World Suicide Prevention Day hashtag, which is hashtag uh, WSPD or hashtag WSPD 2021. So I think you've heard enough from me. So I'm going to ask the panel members to introduce themselves now. So first of all, I'm going to go to Zaina, please. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming today. My name is Zainab. I'm a young person with lived experience of self-harm and suicidal experiences. Um, I am from the Institute for Mental Health's Youth Advisory Group at the University of Birmingham. So I'm here to talk about my lived experience today. Thank you, Zainab. And now can I come to you, Sangeeta, please? Hi, I'm Sangeeta. I'm a consultant in aesthetist at Guys and St. Thomas's Hospital. I very sadly lost my uh, son uh, to a serious mental illness seven years ago. And since then, I have learned a lot about myself and the world around me and the world of suicide prevention. And I'm one of the trustees of Papyrus, the charity for prevention of young suicide. And I'm also an uh, educator as I teach the Youth Mental Health First Aid course and a speaker and a writer. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So can I come to you now, Saurabh? Good evening, everyone. I'm Saurabh Pandey. Now, I'm a general practitioner in uh, Derbyshire. I also have a interest and passion for uh, suicide prevention and self-harm uh, management. Uh, and I have been doing lots of training in that area over the last few years. Uh, so uh, I've got involved strategically as well in the National Suicide Prevention Alliance, which pulls together hundreds of organizations around the country uh, to try and uh, achieve the same uh, aims. So I'm glad to be here tonight, thank you. Thank you. And Maria, can I ask you to introduce yourself and also the guide, please? Thank you, Hannah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Maria Mikhail. Uh, I am an associate professor in the Institute for Mental Health at the University of Birmingham. And I also lead the self-harm and suicide prevention research group within the IMH. Uh, and together with the uh, many members of the youth advisory group, including Zane up here that we are delighted to have on board, um, we uh, co-designed a, um, a guide, a resource called My GP Guide. It's an evidence-informed resource, as Anna has mentioned to support young people and prepare them for their GP consultation and prepare them and empower them to talk about self-harm and suicidal experiences um, with their GP. I've got particular interest in suicide prevention in primary care settings and I have worked in the past uh, very closely with the Royal College of GPs. So whereas in the past we have developed many resources for uh, GPs, what we have identified is a very, very big gap 
that we need um, equally to facilitate help seeking among young people in primary care. So based on evidence from the literature and through many, many consultations with a youth advisory group over an eight month period, I think, uh, we co-designed my uh, GP guide, which we launched on World Suicide Prevention Day. Um, and I'm very, very pleased that we're having this opportunity together today to, to speak and, and share our experiences and highlight the very, very important role of primary care and in particular general practice. In, uh, in suicide prevention. So I'm delighted to have Zainab here and, and Saurabh and, and Sangeeta. And a big thank you, Anna, for chairing the session. Very welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so Maria, would you want to play us the short video now about the guide? I'll stop sharing my screen so you can do that. Yes. So, it's a, so we developed a video um, in order to bring the guide to life with the understanding that young people are not going to read 20 pages of the guide in preparation for their GP consultation, but they're more likely to listen to a seven, eight minute video. Um, we're not going to play the entire video today, but I just wanted to share a, a sort of some snippets of the video with you today. So. It's, it's always a case when you're trying to share, you can't find it. So let me just bear with me for a minute. Self-harm is when someone hurts themselves deliberately. This could include cutting, poisoning and burning. Self-harm is common among young people. Although young people who self-harm do not always do this because they want to end their life, repeated self-harm over a long period could be a sign that a young person might be thinking about suicide. We know that many young people find it very difficult to find the right words to describe how they feel. Visiting your general practitioner to talk about self-harm and suicidal feelings can be very frightening. This is because you might not know what to expect. You might feel anxious or embarrassed, or you might even be wondering whether a GP can help with these experiences. Visiting your GP is the first step towards getting the support you need and deserve. Visiting your GP to talk about self-harm and suicidal experiences can be very frightening. When you feel under pressure, you might find it difficult to describe how you feel and why you feel like that. You can write down a list of concerns, problems or questions you have before your appointment, as well as what kind of help and support you want from your GP. Booking an appointment is one of the first steps, but it is a scary step to have to take. It is important to find your voice and do what is comfortable for you. You only need to discuss what is comfortable, however it will be helpful to go into as much detail as possible. You can do this. Whether this is the first time you're visiting your GP or not, talking about self-harm and suicidal feelings can be difficult. You can bring a trusted friend, a family member or anyone who can support you with you to the appointment. They can sit in the waiting area or they can join you in the appointment. It is important to know that what you say to your GP is confidential. However, there might be cases where your GP has to share information with other professionals. For example, when they are trying to get you the best help you need. Another example is when your GP thinks you might be at risk of death or serious harm. If your GP has to share information about you, they will ask for your consent first and they will tell you what information exactly they will share, with whom and why. You have to be mindful, however, that your GP might still have to share information about you without your consent. Although this might be upsetting, 
Please remember that your GP has your best interest at heart and they want to do the right thing to keep you safe. If a doctor has to disclose information about you to your family, it can be terrifying and incredibly frustrating. It sucks and unfortunately that feeling does not go away, but it is important to remember that this is one step closer to getting better. It is the beginning of the light at the end of the tunnel, as cheesy as that sounds. What your GP might ask. How do you self-harm and where? How often do you self-harm? What goes through your mind before you self-harm? Are you thinking about ending your life? Have you made any plans? How is your sleep, appetite and mood? Do you have a support network, including family, friends or peers you can turn to when things get bad? What helps you cope with stressful events? For example, hobbies, distraction techniques. Medi Thank you, Maria. So, first of all, can I come to you, Zainab? Um, can I ask you to tell us a little bit about your recovery journey and what kind of role general practice played in, um, played, played in that, please? Definitely. So, um, I, um, I'm 20 years old now and I started self-harming when I was 11. So, I had some trauma at the family home, um, which kind of made me suicidal, made me want to self-harm. Um, over kind of um, the next three years, I think, I would um, have various trips to A&E for suicidality. Uh, when I was 14, um, people kind of realised how bad things got and I was put into psychiatric inpatient CAMS units and was sectioned for four years inside um, psychiatric intensive care units and secure units. Um, I got out when I was 18 and I've been I'm doing really well since. Uh, I'm an award-winning mental health advocate, author, TEDx speaker, um, executive um, at various organisations. Um, and I work with um, youth mental health researchers and policy makers to make things better for other young people. But where GP and primary care came, you know, played a part in my journey was um, with, um, when I first kind of got into CAM. So I I, um, I think once the police brought me back after I ran away from home, they were kind of like, you need to go to a GP and seek help for yourself harm and, and wanting to die. Um, and so I um, went in with my parents, which was quite tough because of all the trauma stuff. But um, my GP kind of um, listened to me um, and I told him everything about what, what had gone on. Um, and then I was put into CAMs and, and, and that was that from there. Thank you for that. And Sangeeta, can I come to you about um, your, your family experiences of accessing primary care? So seven years ago in the summer, my son was a, a student at uh, Durham University, he was reading languages, and he came home in the summer and uh, he, his behavior was a bit off. And we took him to a &E and he was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Um, he responded well to medications, and but as soon as he showed the smallest sign of improvement, he was discharged to his GP. It was also partially to facilitate his return to university. But um, he, from being hypomanic, he went into depression very rapidly under the care of the GP. And uh, sadly, um, he was started on antidepressants and that was the only thing that was done for him. His mental state was not monitored. Uh, no community resources were uh, shared and uh, we were not involved. Um, while we were expected to take care of him at home, we really didn't know how ill he was. And later on, at the, so he ended his life uh, two days after his last GP consultation and um, at the coroner's inquest it came out that um, he actually didn't know what the diagnosis was he was just looking after him in the blind because in the discharge summary the hospital had not told him the diagnosis and we didn't know how ill he was because th that had not been shared with us so everybody was looking after the seriously ill child, I will call him a child because science has shown that 
the prefrontal cortex only reaches adult proportions at the age of 25 or so. So, you know, the fact that we call people adults when they are 18 and then leave them to feel isolated when they can't look after themselves and not involve others. So I think there were many gaps in his care. But, um, yeah, we've learned a lot through that. And uh, we hope that this uh, will not uh, continue to happen to other people. And sadly, I'm not the only one who has had experiences like this. I, I now belong to a community of bereaved parents. And this is a much, much oft repeated uh, story. And being a doctor, I know myself that my knowledge of suicide and prevention of suicide was very minimal. You know, before this happened, I didn't really know much at all. It is not part of the syllabus or anything. And uh, so, which, which, which really is sad because, you know, at the end of every article that is sensitive, it says, if you're concerned, please see your GP. So, you know, they play a very vital role. We all do, all of us play a role, however subtle. Thank you. Thank you, Sangeeta. Um, so, Sora, we've already heard of the extreme challenges for GPs and young people and families, but also the vital role. Um, so I'm going to come to you with that big question, which is, so you've trained hundreds of primary care professionals in suicide prevention. Could you share some examples of positive practice you've identified, but also give a sense of some of the kind of challenges, barriers that GPs themselves may face when it comes to the management of people including young people um, with self-harm and kind of suicidal experiences? Big question, I know. Thank, thanks very much, Anna. <clears throat> no, no big ask there then. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, first of all, I just want to say how touching and uh, impressing it is to hear Zainab and Sangeeta talk about this because it must be so difficult, at least initially when you first start talking about things like this it must be incredibly difficult and I'm, I'm so um, grateful to you both um, for sharing uh, your experiences today and so is everybody I'm sure um, and, and really that's why we're here is, is and that's why I'm so pleased to be supporting uh, today because the GPs um, and the primary care team the nurses are all across the country having to um, learn how to best respond to uh, people who have mental distress and suicidality. Uh, and uh, when I've done my, when I first came to Derbyshire a few years ago, um, I'd already got established myself as a keen interest in mental health um, and suicide prevention in Cambridgeshire. Uh, but, but when I came to Derbyshire, I did a little looking around and found nobody had been trained. There's very little training goes on uh, within this field. Um, uh, and there are reasons behind that, which perhaps not for today, but there was a, I invited people to be trained and there was a massive uptake. Everybody wants training. Everybody wants to know more about how to help people who are in distress. I'm talking about the GPs and the nurses and also the practice managers and so on. So there's a huge enthusiasm in the workforce. The, the days when we had to persuade people that mental health was important are, are gone. You know what I mean? Everyone knows that now. It's that, that battle is at least partly won. Let's not say it's 100% won maybe, but it, the idea is, is already now well it, uh, sort of understood that mental health um, is as important as physical health. There's that parity. That, uh, in, in people's minds, at least, that, that it should be as important. What, what there isn't is the same level of training and resources that there should be. Um, that has to follow, and, and it has been following bit by bit, but we, and, and this is why we started the training. So I did, so we trained something like 700 people now in Derbyshire, um, about half of those are GPs, I'd say, um, and the rest were nurses or staff. And they absolutely loved the training. Um, they loved the, the, the training because they so want to talk about this, they so want to hear about this, and they want some um, tools to be able to put in place as well sometimes to help with it. Um, so 
remember the people we're talking about, they are very highly skilled, very highly trained, but not in this area specifically, but generally. And they're used to seeing hundreds of people every day in each practice. And, and of course, one in three of those patients who we see are, are mental health related issues. But just think how many people come in front of you on a daily basis with some kind of mental health issue of distress or illness. It doesn't have to be a mental health illness. It could be just distress because, you know, something terrible has happened in the family or something like this. Um, but you do need those skills of empathy and compassion. And of course, we're le we, I like to think most people in the health service have got a natural level of empathy and compassion, which is why they went into it. But you can fine tune those and you can understand them better and you can use those skills better if you if you practice them and if you understand and if you train in them. One of the things I want people to know is that when you go and see your GP, it's not judgmental and you could go into the GP surgery and I'm um, sorry, the practice to see the GP and say, you know, your problem is you're probably going to be embarrassed. OK, but you're going to say something like maybe it's sex to do with. Uh, being bullied or sexuality or gender identity or or educational uh, stress and and difficulties it could be trauma at home or in some other area workplace whatever the problem is the GP's probably heard it before uh, because as I said one in three and um, and they're, and they're not going to judge you that that's the that's the key thing I would I would reassure people uh, about, uh, in my experience. Um, the GPs do have barriers. They have problems with time. They have problems with workload. But, uh, so getting the appointment can be tricky. Um, if, you, if, you, if you phrase your request in the right way, whether it be through an e-consultation, email consultation, or a telephone consultation, if you're prepared for that and you say, look, I really need to talk to someone about this, it's very difficult if you're not happy on the phone, of course, this is the sort of thing you can say, I'd really like to come in um, and, and see you. And that's the, and so, so even if you do have an initial triage that isn't face-to-face, -face, you should be able to get a face-to-face. -face. And, and you should be able to bring somebody with you if you want to. It could be a parent, it could be a friend, it could be anybody that you feel comfortable with. Um, and then, of course, you've got the, the so-called 10 minute appointment, which can be longer uh, when necessary. So we, we're quite used to extending it from 10 minutes to whatever's necessary uh, when, the, when the need arises. Uh, I think that tends to be easier done if, you've ha if you know what someone's coming in for in the first place. You know, if you know someone's coming in for something like this, I'd probably automatically give them longer, you know, to start with. Um, and then, uh, you build that trusting relationship with your your your, your GP, and it, and that in itself is therapy. I mean, just that fact that you can sit and confidentially talk to someone who listened non-judgmentally, and can put it into context. You know, because you're thinking this is the worst thing in the world, and it might be, but on the other hand, it might be relatively uh, common, and you might not know that, for example. Um, and then what the GPs need is to know how to. Um, uh, refer those people on uh, and to keep them safe uh, in the meantime uh, if they need referral that is they don't always need referral so the training is focused on all of those aspects uh, and making sure that GPs understand the essential safety needs uh, that patients have as well I think I'll stop there because I've probably talked more than five minutes <laughs> That's quite all right. Thank you. So we've clearly heard, I, I like the fact that you, you've, you've stressed the non-judgmental um, and also obviously the key role the primary care can play. So Zainab, can I come back to you and ask you to reflect on your own experiences? Would you say that you have had positive experience? You, you described um, it as tough, yeah, let's go to the GP earlier, but would you say that you've also had some positive experiences of going to the GP? Would that be fair to say? No, definitely. I think that um, with like my visit to the GP was kind of like, um, I think of it like a gate, like opening a gate to get me the relevant support that I needed. And whilst that support didn't come straight away and it was over a long period of time and, you know, went through so many different diagnoses like psychosis and complex trauma and autism before I got to that point, I think that um, my initial meeting with the GP was really um, 
really useful in the sense that my GP, like I, I had been in my childhood GP, so I'd always gone to him for like viral infections and all sorts. And so this time, I think it was less daunting that I kind of had seen him before. Um, and um, something that struck me was that I was telling him, this is how I'm self-harming. You know, I don't want to be here. Um, I, you know, I, I, you know, don't want to continue living, things like that. He didn't listen to ask loads of questions and it like, with a lot a lot of the time with mental health professionals it's kind of a bit like interrogations like asking so many different questions and um and my gp he asked the important questions about safety and um severity of self-harm things like that but he listened to understand he didn't listen to respond and he um he, I felt like he didn't judge me, like he could have said, you know, you're clever, you know, you're um, achieving really well at school um, and, you know, why do you want to die? You don't have a good reason to. Like he could have said that because of how he'd known my family and, and me as a child, but actually he didn't say any of, any of those things. He showed me empathy and compassion um, and kind of um, even though I didn't feel safe in myself in terms of I knew that I wanted to end my life and I didn't feel safe where I was living at my home. Um, he made me feel safe in the moment that he had held the hope for me. I didn't have any hope in myself, but he held that for me and held the burden, even if it was just for maybe like a, um, a 10, 15 minute appointment. Um, and um, I think that if it hadn't been for him, his um, the appointment that I had with that GP, um, I think that I probably wouldn't have engaged with cams and things as well. Um, and um, I think having that first initial consultation with somebody to talk about my mental health um, was um, it was really tough. But I think it showed me that there are people who care. And that yeah, people around me didn't care, but people were there and they did want to help me. Um, and so that was really powerful for me. And I didn't really understand the the sheer um, kind of importance and, and power of that interaction I had with him until it was um, kind of when I was an inpatient, where um, it was a lot of restricted practice and restraints from self harm. You know, that's not kind of empathetic. But I used to think about um, all the different interactions I had with other professionals, like my GP, and I thought, hang on, like he didn't, um, you know, kind of shade me on the floor when I was um, saying that I wanted to self-harm he actually listened to me and wanted to help um, and actually there are good people out there and I didn't trust many people in the world but I think I trusted his um, ability to want to help even if he was limited in what he could do. Thank you that was such a powerful narrative um, and I've got one more question for you Bernard, but I'm going to come to Maria first do you want to jump in? Thank you. Um, a comment for Zainab. I think what you mentioned about listening to understand and not listening to respond is, is really, really key, isn't it? Because we know even from a research that we carry out that listening and just being there with a young person is in itself therapeutic. Uh, so thank you for mentioning that. And if it's okay, I'd like to go back to Saurabh just for a quick question. And so from the, from the work that we have done with, um, with GP, sometimes they mention that there are, yes, suicide prevention is challenging. It's part of our everyday job. It is challenging. But sometimes they, GPs identify particular challenges when it comes to this age group, sort of 12 to 25, the younger age group. And I was wondering whether this is, this is something that you can reflect a little bit, whether there are particular challenges when it comes to young people um, well, there are a couple I can think of. Uh, one is to do with, um, there's a culture difference between someone who's uh, in authority and um, older versus someone who's uh, younger and possibly brighter <laughs> than I am. So yes, there could be a culture difference uh, and it takes a little bit of you know, faith to be able to get past that so you can get that relationship established. Um, uh, and people like, that. it was interesting when what Zainab was saying, I mean, it sounds as though she was a bit surprised that her GP was quite nice in the end, um, because most of us are. 
basically nice. Uh, so there's that. And then another one would be the organizational side of it, you know, to do with education. People who are young are often moving from place to place. Uh, and that, that was reflected in, in perhaps uh, some of what Sangeeta was describing about, you know, home and then university home. And this can cause disruption in services, uh, which is detrimental as well. Um, I don't know if I've captured all of the things, but those two would be two examples. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Sangeeta, did you want to jump in? Yes, I just wanted to say that, you know, of course, listening to the patients is very important. But like we said at the beginning of the video, sometimes patients are not able to directly ask for help. You know, it's 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 difficult to say I'm really struggling, you know. So I think it takes a lot to come to that point where you ask for help and to acknowledge that, I think. And also listening to the carers and the parents, you know. I was asked, I was saying, I didn't know what it was, but I knew something wasn't right. And I was saying, you know, he's really, can you refer him back to the specialists, please? And uh, because he's, he was only recently discharged and he rapidly deteriorated. And, and I was told, uh, this is not the first time I'm treating somebody like this, you know, which I understand, <laughs> you know, but also see, I'm his mother, I'm with him, 23 and a half hours in the day. So if I'm saying something, um, please listen. You know, I'm not just saying it. Um, I may not be the patient, I may be the carer, but still, I also deserve to be heard. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think that's, a, again, a very powerful point. And I do want to come back to you in a moment, Sangeeta, but first of all, I was, I was interested what's coming up across these is that sense of relationship um, with a GP. Because then I noticed that you talked about, you know, the GP who have known you for a long time. And I was going to ask you actually whether you kind of, whether you had expected that the GP would support you. But then I was wondering actually whether you expected that less because they knew you or more because they knew you, whether that relationship played into that. What were your expectations when you went into that consultation? Um, I had no idea of the mental health work world as, as I would say I think I didn't know what I was going to expect I just knew that he he knew me that he knew me you know for my whole childhood and I thought that would be that would mean that he would judge me more because he knew me because um often like if we know someone we let down that professional barrier um and I thought that was going to be the case um but actually um and I knew that he was really helpful because he always talked about solutions and, um, you know, kind of treatments and stuff. Um, so I was expecting him to be really practical and say, um, kind of, you do or don't need help. Um, but actually, he connected with me. He didn't, he didn't try to help and put things into place. He tried to connect. And I think that was more important. And that's what I needed in that moment. Um, and yeah, I think he, he was, it was it wasn't, I didn't know what I was going to get from that GP consultation. I could, uh, I had prepared myself for him to say, you know, you're just being silly, but also prepared myself to think, what if they put me in a unit or um, stuff like that? And um, it was really anxiety provoking. And I think he clocked on to that. Um, and a lot of, um, a lot of GPs, like they, um, well, doctors in general, I think it's part of the medical professional, the medical model is to is to be a problem solver, to have the helper helpy relationship and to um, move away from kind of like connecting, but moving more towards um, kind of saying I have done so many years of training, um, you know, I've got so much experience as a doctor, I know what's best for you rather than wanting to listen about what that young person thinks is best for them. Um, and um, my GP wasn't like that at all. He didn't have that helper helpy kind of um, kind of narrative. Um, for him, it was about um, kind of reassuring me and something that I didn't want that my parents did was they flapped. So like they were flapping and like, oh my gosh, this is so bad. This is the worst thing ever. And he was the opposite of that. So it felt, it made me feel calmer as well. Um, and that's what I needed to feel. I needed to feel calm, reassured and safe um, when I didn't feel that way in any other aspect of my life. Thank you. So when you came out of that first GP consultation, 
Um, how would you say you were kind of feeling at that point? I think um, I think often with suicidality, there's ambivalence. Like sometimes you'll think, you know, what I'm going to make this plan and I'm going to do this and and that's how that's going to be the end goal for me um but after that initial consultation although that hadn't changed as such I kind of thought maybe there's people that care and maybe maybe um it's worth hang like seeing how things go um before I carry out my plan because maybe there's people around who who um have compassion for me and maybe all the things that had happened to me um kind of was going to be understood by someone and that somebody else would um kind of carry the burden with me um and like it was it was a process of learning together and moving towards collaborating with me and and thinking about hope because i remember he said at the end um have hope um and um not like from you know, other in clinicians that I'd had, they'd never said stuff like that. It was very clinical. Um, that, that was later down the line. And he was the first one um, to say, kind of have hope. Um, and so that was really um, meaningful for me in that moment. Um, and I thought, hang on, there's there's people out there who who want to see me do well. Um, so yeah, that was a really powerful moment for me. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And Sangeeta, can I come to you now? Um, so, and I'm going to pose, I said to you that massive question that I, I posed to Sohrab earlier, which is from your perspective as a parent, could you share some examples of kind of positive practice in, in primary care, but also again, the flip side. So exam, um, examples of kind of where you feel improvement would be needed. Sure. Thank you. I was really grateful that, um, you know, Sagar was given a double appointment every time we went and saw him. But, um, and that was really required, but I, I still feel that a lot of that time wasn't spent very well, but it was spent with him. Um, and, um, and I really feel like there wasn't a holistic approach towards it. You know, medications were started without discussing side effects, without monitoring effects. Uh, there wasn't, and I also felt like there was a huge hesitation to talk about suicide. You know, while I knew there was something wrong, I didn't know what it was. But Sagar's PHQ-9 was 27 on 27. His score was the maximum that it could be. It couldn't be worse than that. And it had deteriorated from 19 to 27 while he had been on the medication. So maybe it was a natural progression of the illness. Maybe it was something else, but I had no clue. It was never discussed. He had very clearly said that he feels like ending his life almost every day for at least two weeks before that consultation. And that was not discussed at all. So I think doctors are also people, you know, we bring our own biases and our own ideas to work. And that can't, you can't erase that, but we can superimpose that with training. And so I believe that suicide prevention should be part of every medical, nursing, dental syllabus, undergraduate, postgraduate. It should be uh, what we do. You know, we have pretty much assigned it to public uh, health. You know, it's a public health issue or it's for the psychiatrists. No, it's for everyone. And that is the reason because we as medics, I mean, I speak as a medic myself and I speak of my own ignorance in this as well, that we have never actually taken ownership of suicide prevention. It is something that happens by the by, you know. So I think we need to take more ownership of this and uh, recognize that community plays a huge part in suicide prevention, that where you sit in the world, what is the meaning of your existence? You know, all these fundamental questions come up when somebody is really down and out. And I think to be able to connect with them at that level and say that your life has meaning, you know, you can play the drums, you speak French, you, you know, somebody could have connected him with the things that meant something to him and tell him that you, you will be able to do these things just, you know, and maybe refer, refer. I think the compartmentalization of healthcare is really a problem because 
you know, uh, there is a big barriers of communication like we've seen in Sagar's case between primary and secondary care. And when GPs, I know they are terribly unsupported. When they want to refer somebody, they know that there's long waiting lists, you know, they don't get seen. So I think uh, it's a multifaceted problem. And there isn't one quick answer, but I think we all need to just keep chipping away at it and uh, bringing it to the notice um, of the people who can make a difference, like the policy makers, the NHS executives to make things a little bit better. Thank you. That's fantastic. And Maria, did you want to jump in? I just wanted to ask um, Sangeeta, uh, you've mentioned about before, and correct me if I'm wrong, that there was hesitation to talk about suicide. Uh, and this is something that we find as well from, from, um, from our work, from our research program. And I was wondering, what do you think this hesitation is all about? Is it about opening a can of worms? Is it... No, I think I think it is still, uh, you know, the belief in the myth that if you talk about it, you will put the idea in their head, you know? And also the lack in confidence, if they say yes, what will I do? Because they don't know that if they say yes, it's still all right, you know, what, what will I do? Because they have, a lot of us haven't had the training. So, you know, it's much, much easier to handle if somebody just fell unconscious on the street. I can, I, I can do that. You know, I know ABC, I know CPR, you know, it's been hammered into me. But if somebody comes to me and says, listen, I can't bear the thought of living another day. I really don't know what to do. I'm like, oh no, you'll be all right. Don't worry, you know, because I've never been trained, you know, so also because I've never been there myself. I don't know how it feels. And nobody can tell me that unless I actually want to go there and really understand how this person might be. And to know that this is a much bigger picture than um, prescribing antidepressants. That's not the full answer. Sarah, do you want to come in? Hi, yeah, gosh, I mean, it's so difficult to follow that incredibly powerful uh, commentary there by Sangeeta, which uh, is full of wisdom and insight, actually, as far as I can see. Um, so I just wanted to um, mention a couple of things. One is that um, the role of the GP in this is not just to refer. Okay, so just to be clear about that. So general practitioners are, are able to help people who are at the less lower lower end of the spectrum from distress to severely mentally ill, let's say, and um, they are able to help and and they are able to contain and support um, people in that situation, even young people. They may want to prescribe, although I I do voice a, a little bit of a mixture of sort of concern and positivity about medication because it can sometimes be the answer to some of the problems, but it can also sometimes be a problem, uh, as in it can uh, make certain patients sometimes feel a bit worse for a short period of time anyway. And so we have to be uh, careful not to just rush down that road. Um, but on the other hand, if someone's distressed continually for weeks on end, and, and you know, medication may well be part of the solution. Uh, and, and then there's the other things that we can do, and, and, and like Sangeeta says about the community, you know, why, why can't we refer them locally to something that is helping them to feel, in, you know, a sense of well-being or, or a sense of self-worth, you know, and, and, and I will just say these things are happening now to a large extent or to a larger extent. So we have um, social prescribing in general practice now where your social prescriber can refer a patient uh, or a person rather to um, something that's happening in their area, which is good for them uh, and that, with their agreement, of course. And that's non-medical, so that's good. Um, so it doesn't have to be CAMH all the time, you know, which is the other name for children and adolescent mental health services. Um, someone wrote in the um, 
what's it now, the, the, the chat, uh, what happens if you didn't have a great experience with a GP? And yes, uh, most practices have you know, half a dozen GPs working there. So just ask to see a different GP. Don't have to change practice. Uh, people have done that for every GP in the land. They've thought, someone's just thought, ah, that wasn't a good fit, <laughs> didn't get on with him or her. Um, for whatever reason, it might not be um, a particularly important reason. It might just be you just don't get on or something. So, uh, or, or they didn't listen to you properly. But just, just ask to see a different GP the next time. Um, that's not a problem at all. And then there was a comment about uh, training. I agree with you, Sangeeta, that training should be um, universal, let's say, uh, throughout the whole workforce. And there are different ways we can try and achieve that at strategic and level. And finally, a word about postvention, which is the role that we need to support and look after um, people who have been bereaved by uh, someone dying by suicide. Postvention is an important area that has become quite well um, shared recently. Um, in Derbyshire, for example, we now have a postvention support service that we've just commissioned in the last year or so. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. And thanks for picking up those questions I was just about to pose you to, so that was fantastic. Um, I'd like to move the discussion on now to the GP guide itself. So just for the last kind of 15 minutes that we've got. So this is a question that is for all of you, which is in what ways do you think that my GP guide can facilitate the best, so the ideal, we're going, we're looking at being aspirational now, the best consultation with a GP for a young person with, with self-harm or suicidal experiences. We've, we've kind of, we've looked at challenges and barriers, so how can my GP guide get us beyond those and facilitate a really good consultation? Um, so I will come to Zainab first, do you want to jump in? Definitely. So I think that the My GP Guide um, can definitely, it helps, I think it's going to help young people and the systems that support them. So it will give training to both the young person and to GPs about how to um, how to tackle self-harm, how to um, relieve um, kind of feelings of suicidality and, and, and actions. And I think that um, you coming from a young person perspective, like it's really scary having to reach out um, and, and say those first words um, of I'm struggling. Um, and I think the GP guide um, helps to, um, to kind of say to the young person, it's okay because um, you're gonna like GPs um, to know what they're doing with this guide. And the fact that it's got the before, during and after um, is really, really useful because often like I've heard a lot um, about how um, people go to their GP, um, but there's not any um, emphasis on how you feel before and the expectations that you might have, but also how you feel after of like feeling guilty because you've told somebody about your suicide plans. Um, and that's something that isn't talked about very much. And people just think, get help, speak to a professional, but they don't think of the um, the prerequisites um, or the aftermath of that. And so, um, I think the main thing that it does is reassure young people, but also train um, GPs to say that um, that it's not it's not um, it's not hard to reassure a young person, um, and it's easy to comfort them in a time of distress, um, and um, shows how to connect to a young person um, when you might feel a bit uncomfortable with the situation. Thank you, Zainab. Um, Sangeeta, can I come to you next? Yes, I really like the way it has broken up into uh, broken up the consultation into before, during and after. Mm -hmm. That's really nice. You know, it really helps you break it up, think about it in a much broader way and in, in a very considerate way. You know, you can tell that it has been co-produced, you know, just from that and uh, really thought through deeply. And the best thing about it is this safety plan. You know, if everybody, every professional knew Safety plan is basically a, an excuse for a compassionate conversation. You know, keeping, keeping the person completely plugged into their community, keeping them in touch with their life. That is what is important. It's not like they want to die. It's they want to end their pain. And their pain is so severe that it is making them lose touch with who they are. You see, 
And I think if we can keep them in touch with how loved they are, you know, people that care for them, the GPs themselves can make them feel connected. Connection is the main thing because in depression, what happens is you lose connection, even with yourself, with your own life. So it's really important. I think it requires another level of compassion, I think, um, and understanding to know that this person is completely cut off you know, to keep them plugged into their own life, into their community, into the people who love them. It's really, really important. And that's what the safety plan does. And I think if it, we don't look at it as a set of questions, but as a conversation that keeps them connected with their lives and with the people who care for them, that's the main thing. And with the crisis services, unfortunately, uh, in our community, we don't have you know, in crisis, everybody goes either to the GP or a &E. There aren't alternative models of care. That's what we need. We need more choice of places to go to, non-clinical places. And and hopefully, you know, as a result of these kind of conversations, that will happen more and more. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And Sarah, from your point of view, what does this GP Well, first of all, there's nothing, more there's nothing more powerful than hearing the voice of the people especially young people, it's always a joy to hear their voices. And Zainab, you're an example of that. <laughs> it's a real pleasure. But to hear people's experiences, um, that's what, no service is worth anything if the people who it's designed for don't think it's very useful, valuable or approachable, so or accessible. So yeah, that's the first thing is to listen to them and to help them to connect with the GPs but you know there are just as many lessons in there for primary care as there are for young people because sometimes primary care needs a reminder of how difficult it is for the young people to do these things and so it's quite helpful uh, for, for practices. I think it should be uh, distributed out as widely as possible if um, so for example in Derbyshire we have a, an emotional well-being website that's been created by uh, Derbyshire uh, County Council and it's on there now. Uh, any practice can uh, signpost to it uh, using its practice website as well. Um, I don't see any reason why it shouldn't be easily accessible by any practice. And on the safety plans thing, I would agree that everybody should be encouraged who's been suicidal, that is, uh, to uh, make themselves, uh, uh, start making themselves a safety plan, which they can do without help from anybody else, but I would I would also add that if they go to uh, uh, a GP, the GP will be able to really help them focus in on that safety plan and, um, and, and, and make it as robust as, uh, as possible. Um, those are my thoughts. Yeah. Thank you. I'll come back briefly to you, Sankhita, and then I'm going to... Yes, there is an app oh, called yeah. Stay Alive. There is an app called Stay Alive and all of us can download it. I've had it on my phone for ages, which is basically a safety plan. And uh, all of us can have that. It's for free. It's by grassroots in Brighton. It's a fantastic resource. And I would recommend that, you know, these kind of resources, the GPs should know that they can actually tell people what the local resources are and uh, tell them about the online resources like a free app, uh, like Papyrus. Uh, which are more spe uh, specific for young people. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you. So, Maria, for the last few minutes, I'm just going to come to you. So, you led this work in Birmingham and, and this guide co produced with Zainab and others, and now we have it. So, well, overall, how do you see that it kind of facilitates that best consultation that we're aiming for in primary care? And how are you going to build on that? Where's it going next? Thank you. Thank you, Anna. I think when we started this, this, this piece of work, I think the, the aim, and hopefully we have achieved that, is to put young people at the front and centre. And the, this, um, the, this guide would have looked very differently if I was sitting on my own. <laughs> developing it. So to have Zainab and, and many of the other young people involved has been has been very empowering for me also as a, as a researcher. I've learned a lot from them and I continue to learn a lot uh, from them. Uh, so what we wanted to do is demystify primary care and particularly general practice when it comes to mental health and, and, and suicide prevention. We were very surprised when we started this piece of work to find out that 
some young people didn't know that they can seek uh, help from their GP about self-harm and suicidal experiences. There was one particular young person who said to me, I found myself in a, in a waiting room full of people coughing and sneezing. And I was wondering, I kept wondering, why am I here? But actually, you know, GPs lie at the heart of the communities and, and you should access them and you should seek for help, whether it's for, you know, coughing or sneezing or, or feeling, feeling low and anxious. In terms of where this is going, so um, sort of, you know, mentioned very well sort of the dissemination and actually this is what we are doing at the moment, widely disseminating the GP guide. Uh, we've been in contact with many clinical commissioning groups across the country. Um, the, uh, so, so it's about disseminating the, gu disseminating the guide as, as widely as possible and then working in partnership with the young people to build the evaluation around the guide. So for me, a key question is that, does it facilitate help seeking? Does it empower young people to talk to their GPs about self-harm and suicidal experiences? Um, what are their views? Explore young people's views uh, about seeking help from their GP and what impact has this guy had, if any? Uh, so yes, watch, watch this space, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm aware that we could probably talk all night, but we are running out of time. Zainab, can I come to you just very quickly to say, where, where would you like this to go next, this guide? I think that this guide has um, a lot of potential to go even wider. I think it should be used across all GP practices across the country. Um, and um, to have training led um, by young people and clinicians that's co-designed, co co-produced and deliver that to GPs. I think having um, that training or having different GP guides um, for different um, aspects of, of mental illness, so having GP guides about um, being trauma-informed and complex trauma, um, often called personality disorder, which is a um, uh, kind of a bit of a controversial diagnosis, um, which I've got, um, having um, GP guides about kind of psychosis and, and thought disorders, having um, GP guides about autism and learning disabilities. Um, I think I think there's so much scope to make this really big. Um, that's where I'd like to see this go. I think that's an amazing idea. Thank you very much. And thank you to just one the last words from, from you in terms of where you where would you like to see the guide go? I fully uh, agree with Zainab on that. I think this, it should not be a thing. It should already be universal. You know, everybody should already be doing this. It's already late, you know? So, I mean, if this was there when Sagar was ill, uh, we don't know, you know, it could have been a different outcome, but it wasn't. So I think it has a huge potential uh, to, to, to change lives. And also I think, I think uh, we, we haven't really had the time to talk about confidentiality, but I think all families are different. But, you know, GPs often know the families and they know that, you know, especially with permission of the young person. It, I think it's important to let them know that if they do share the information, it's good for them. You know, it might actually help them stay on the side of life. So um, I think that should uh, be part of the consultation as well. Thank you. Thank you. And I think confidentiality, you're right, we haven't talked about it, but it's a, it's a huge one in terms of barrier or facilitator that we could probably talk about for the next hour. But I think overall what we've done in the last hour is shown the enormous role that primary care can play in suicide prevention. There's an interesting comment in the chat, which is that should we be aiming to train absolutely everyone to support people um, who are thinking of taking their own lives? And actually, Yes, um, I, I like the fact that that's talked about as a life skill, but it's true that what we've seen is um, across these discussions is that we should be thinking much more in terms of how primary care can support people. And I'm, I'm just thinking back to Zainal's words, which were that we should perhaps be supporting primary care to listen and kind of just understand and that sense of sitting with someone and really listening to what they're going through and Sangeeta's words which were your sense that you said connecting that person with who they are and what they love and that meaning that real sense of how you get somebody beyond that crisis moment and the enormous role that primary care can play in that um, has I think been really highlighted over that this last hour but of course 
we could probably talk about the challenges to that too uh, for another hour, but we won't. And um, because I, um, what we have now is the fantastic GP guide. Um, and so Maria, did you want to come in for the last word just on that? Um, just before I can see a lot of people are, are giving their apologies and leaving because I know it's time, but what I would like to uh, ask kindly people is to complete a, a very, very short survey that we have, which will help plan for future events, but also for future iterations of my GP guide. And, um, you know, there are not many things that I'm proud in my academic career. <laughs> which spans uh, approximately sort of 15, 20 years. Oh, you're getting away your age. <laughs> yes, uh, but this is definitely one of the one of the highlights. And I wish I could take credit, but I, I cannot. Uh, I did the research. And then when I presented the findings of the research to the youth advisory group, and I say, what do we do with this? Uh, the young people came, well, clearly we need to develop something here to support young people in their, in their journey. So this was not my idea. Uh, I, pr I probably helped sort of organize and, and set up, but this was all down to Zainab and many, many other young people, some of who I can see in, in, in the panel. And also, can I highlight the very important role of the youth participation leads that we have in the IMH? So Naya Campbell and Charlotte Saunders, who do an amazing work in bringing together researchers and, and the youth advisory group for important work such as this. Thank you. But yeah, you took all the words out of my mouth. I was going to say, actually, you, you can take a large amount of credit. But yes, it also goes to all the young people too. Um, so on that note, I just want to say thank you very much to all the panellists um, for, I mean, a very powerful, very poignant and very important discussion. Um, so thank you very much to all of you. And thank you to everyone who joined us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.